got keeping me company tonight. I have got Matt Goodwin, the Professor of Politics at the University of Kent, and also the co-founder of Navarra Media, Aaron Bastani. Good evening to Amen. you, Good both evening. gents. Uh, and you know the drill, as I've just said, it's not just about us, it's about you at home as well. So you can get in touch all the usual ways, gbviews at gbnews.com, or you can tweet or X me at GB News. There is so much I want to focus on tonight. It's a Rishi Sunak special. What a treat. Shall we start then perhaps by casting our mind back? Many people, you get in touch with me night after night, many of you will say, but hold on, Michelle, this Rishi Sunak fella, he's unelected. Us members, we didn't even actually want him in the first place. You're a harsh bunch. But there's some truth to this when you actually look, Matt, at uh, the logistics of this, because uh, Liz Truss and uh, Sunak ultimately was those guys head to head. And uh, yes, uh, Sunak was the MP's choice, but when it came to the next stage of the member vote, it was actually uh, Liz Truss who got that. So I think a lot of people still feel slightly bruised, if you like, um, and feeling actually my vote didn't matter about who was the leader. I think that's absolutely spot on. There's always been this question about legitimacy around the Rishi Sunak uh, appointment. You know, he was chosen by his fellow MPs. It wasn't the grassroots. There wasn't a very strong mandate for Rishi Sunak. And that has always been a sort of ticking time bomb at the heart of his premiership. It's always really thrown doubt over just how popular is this guy among conservative activists, members and the party faithful. And of course, what we've seen since he was appointed at the end of 2022 is a sharp decline in his popularity out there in the wider country mm -hmm. as well. So it's not only that he's he's been seen as a sort of, I guess, um, I don't want to say the leader of a coup inside the Conservative Party, but he's always been seen as somebody that maybe wasn't there under proper circumstances. Indeed, and, and I'm going to come on to, and I'm going to come on to in a second, because one of the things I want to talk about is all well and good saying about how he got here. But in a second with you, I want to explore uh, polling and look yep. at what that picture looks like. But for now, Aaron, your thoughts in terms of how we pick our leaders, how that process works. So two things. It's not just Sunak we should be thinking about here. He's got a foreign secretary, David Cameron, not mm -hmm. even an MP. He's got a Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, a serial loser when it comes to Conservative Party leadership elections. So you really have a coterie at the top of the Conservative Party, very much unrepresentative, not just actually of their activists, but of what people voted for in their droves in 2019. And I think that's a bigger problem. You know, if Sunak was the cherry on the top of the cake, and actually the rest of the project was broadly in line with the kinds of policies, politics they were advancing in the last general election, I don't think people would mind so much. But there has been, metaphorically, let's say, a coup. In terms of policy, there's certainly been a coup. The only thing they've- Is that not a bit dramatic? No, I don't think it is. No, I don't think it is. In 2019, um, the the reason why, in my estimation, the reason why Boris Johnson gets this massive majority is he's offering transformation, levelling up, dealing with regional inequality, taking power out of London. And I look at Sunak, I look at Cameron, I look at Hunt, and I think that is more of the same, that's more power in Westminster. It is the opposite of the formula, which was so alluring to the electorate five years ago. Well, th what, just briefly on that, you know, when, we, when we think about isms, what is Sunakism? And I do actually agree with you in the sense that he's too technocratic, he's very wooden, he's a bit of a nerd, he's really into policy, which is a good thing, but he's not very good at communicating to the wider country. Let's see how he does tonight with the undecided voters. Mm. But at the same time, I think Aaron's right in that post-Brexit, what voters in this room later, I suspect, will be looking for is, you know, where is the big vision? Where is the change on immigration? Where is the change on the political economy? Where, where's the leveling up? Where's all the stuff we were promised after Brexit, which of course was never just a vote to leave the European Union, it was a vote for a completely different country, a completely different political project. Has Sunak really understood that? Well, what do you think at home? Do you think he's understood that? Uh, I was talking to a taxi driver on the way in, the front of all knowledge, I've got to say, and I asked him, who did you vote for uh, in the last election? And he said, I voted for Boris Johnson. I said, oh, why? And he said, I've got to say, for no real policy reasons, but just thought, he seemed like a, a good guy. Mm. It was more about personality than lots of the things that you've just been uh, talking about. Lots of you are getting in touch with me now. Uh, you're telling me the kind of questions that you would be uh, putting to uh, Rishi Sunak if you were here, Clive says. Uh, can I just say, I voted twice against Rishi Sunak. <laughs> 
You're a harsh man, Clive. Would you get up and point that out to him if you were here tonight? Lots of you are asking. Kevin says I'd be asking a question about defence. Uh, Richard would be asking one about the NHS. Paul, uh, why can't we abolish the House of Lords? Heidi, should we uh, keep spending money to uh, Ukraine? Of course, uh, migration, that's coming up a lot as well. So keep your thoughts coming in. But let's uh, fast forward to current day then. Mm. Uh, you know your polls inside and out. What does the picture look like currently for Rishi Sunak? Yeah, well, what was interesting thing is when Team Sunak came in, remember, we were told the adults were back in charge because you just had Boris Johnson and Partygate and you'd had Liz Truss and the Conservatives collapsing in the polls. The big promise for Sunak was, was that he's the guy that would get the party back together. Now, if you look at the polls, on every measure of party strength, the Conservatives are weaker today than they were when Rishi Sunak took over. Their national poll rating has collapsed. They're not trusted on any single issue over the Labour Party, maybe with the exception of defence, but nobody, to be honest, is going to vote at the next election based on what happens in Ukraine or the Middle East. His ratings are now at a record low. He trails behind Keir Starmer on every measure of leadership. He's only won one of the by-elections that they face, and that was Boris Johnson's seat. So arguably the Johnson factor was probably more relevant there than the Rishi Sunak factor. So I'd be saying to all those people in Team, team Sunak, look, you said the adults were back in charge. Mm. Well, well, where's the turnaround? Where's the comeback story here? There isn't one. Is that fair? I think it's entirely fair. There's no oomph. You know, you talked about Boris Johnson in 2019 and that taxi driver. A lot of people voted for Boris Johnson. Look, partly the things I've said, that's the subtext. Overtly, it's, I want to be proud of my country. This guy has some character, some tenacity. He's got something about him. And again, I think those are all things that, frankly, people would not say about Rishi Sunak. Mm. Not that they're saying about Keir Starmer, by the way. Mm. I think most people would make the exact same criticisms of Starmer than Sunak. But the point is, they would say, well, after 14 years, let's give the other guys a, a crack of the whip. I think that's the default right now. On the polling, my goodness, Michelle, you know, it really can't be overstated how bad things are for the Tories. On poll after poll, they're in the low to mid-20s. Mm. The worst general election result for the Conservative Party in history was 1906. I think they got something like 156 mm. seats. Right now, they're getting less than that. Mm. And so people love to say, Jeremy Corbyn, the worst result for Labour since 1930. Forget all that. The worst result for the Tory party ever. If they could, this is just my opinion. And look, there's a long time until the next general election. If the Tories can even get to 31%, which is what John Major gets in 1997, I think where we are right now, that would be an accomplishment. Just, just briefly on that as well. The average poll rating of the government, net satisfaction is minus 65. If you want a metric for that, in the royal family, Prince Andrew's rating is minus 65. That's Very kind good. of where Rishi Sunak's government is in the popularity. But state. these things can change though, can't they, on a sixpence? So something can happen and immediately people's view can actually think, well, actually he's, I don't know, if Rishi Sunak came out tonight and said, you know what, I'm going to declare a national emergency, I'm going to start pushing back, turning back these boats in the channel, and then you went round to people and you asked them, you know, what's your vision in terms of the leader? I reckon that would actually bolster uh, Rishi Sunak. Okay, so there's one way in which he turns this around, which he's, he's squeezes all of the undecided voters that are here tonight, all of the people that are also saying, by the way, they might vote for the Reform Party, which is on now about 12% in the polls. He gets all of those people back. How does he do that? What's their number one issue? Stopping the boats, mm. reducing, eliminating illegal migration. If he does that, Sure, but that means he's going to have to leave the ECHR, the European courts. It means he's going to have to overturn or reform the Human Rights Act. It means he's going to have to do what many Conservatives wanted their party to do with an 80-seat majority, which was completely change the foundation that was left by Tony Blair and New Labour. Reform the Equalities Act, reform the Human Rights Act. And the Conservatives, time and time again, have shown themselves unwilling to be the genuinely radical revolutionary party that they told the country they would be after Brexit. So I suspect all these voters, Michelle, are going to look at Rishi Sunak with a lot of scepticism and say, are you really the guy that's going to deliver that kind of watershed change? Well, he will obviously be hoping that the answer to that question is a big fat yes. Uh, Lil, look at this. I've just read your mind. You'd be saying uh, to Rishi Sunak, why are you not calling for a national um, emergency, basically, to protect the people of this country from uncontrolled illegal migration? Uh, Graham says you'd be asking him about why on earth did you cancel HS2 and then uh, carry on talking about levelling up. 
Brian, you're saying, Michelle, the question's simple. Why aren't you putting the armed forces out there to patrol our immediate borders in the channel? So, I mean, I've got to say there's a big uh, cross section um, in terms of topics. You are spanning pretty much everything at the moment. I'm interested in your thoughts as well about both of um, these guys saying a second ago that actually they think that Rishi Sunak lacks oomph. Do you agree with that? And is that what we actually need in this country? A little bit more oomph? Or do you think we need a little bit more calm, uh, stability? Tell me your thoughts on that. Arnie says, can I just say, I voted Boris at the last general election, but not this time around. Uh, absolutely not. You say it is reform for you. Well, tell me, how will you be voting in this next election? And also, I want to know, how is your uh, position right now? And then get back in touch with me as well at the end of the Sunak People's Forum and tell me whether or not he changed your mind.